welcome to The Power of One. Today, I am going to be speaking with Dr. Etsy. We are going to have a conversation that will walk us through how services for those suffering with a mental illness has changed over the years. There are people still suffering with a mental illness and they still need services. Welcome to the show, Dr. Etsy. Thank you, Melanie. Dr. Etsy, times have changed. Mm -hmm. we've, we've been through COVID. It just seems like crime has changed. Yes. And some of the things that are taking place today, you might stop to think to yourself, was mental illness a factor here? Mm -hmm. It seems that it's hard to get services now for some people who are suffering with a mental illness. And the thing that breaks my heart is I don't want something to happen to someone who has a mental illness or I don't want them to do something to someone else. Walk us through. We're mm -hmm. going to listen. Because okay. I, you look like you're 21. You do. You look like you're 21. <laughs> but I, I know you've probably been around for, for a little while. Tell us how services for those who are suffering from a mental illness used to be 20, 30 years ago. And then walk us through, through the present on how it's changed. Yes. I'm so happy to do this. I appreciate the opportunity. I mean, you know, at this stage in my life, it's all about giving this knowledge away and letting people know what's going on because it just seems like um, every, on every level of society, whether it's medical help, mental health, uh, all, all levels of society, things are more and more complicated and really more and more difficult to maneuver through unless you have lots and lots of money. So um, I, I think I do have a really good perspective on this. Um, I entered my graduate training and education in 1985, but it goes back even earlier than that. So um, what I learned in graduate school in my clinical psychology training was that in the early 60s, when JFK was president, um, he was investing tons of money into mental health. In right. fact, if my memory serves me correctly, he had an older sister with a mental illness. And so he, he was aware personally how important mental health services were. So he was, like I said, investing lots and lots of money. I mean, at that time, I think it was like hundreds of millions, which now would be billions, right? Um, and just giving it to the states and the counties and the cities. And so our public mental health system was kind of born in the early 60s. And it was fabulous, okay? It was working very well. So by the time I got to graduate school in 1985, that's when I came to Philadelphia because I, I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, but uh, I was admitted to a program here in Philadelphia. At the time, it was Hahnemann University. And uh, just down the street, just around the corner from Hahnemann was JFK Mental Health Center, Community Mental Health Center. And so there were all these community mental health centers all over the country. And JFK in Center City on Broad Street was one of the best. Oh. Um, it was one of the best. And I had... Now, by that time, see, this is what's interesting. I wasn't aware of all this um, until a couple of years into my graduate training. But um, so in 1985, I, it was my first training experience, my first, they called it a practicum experience. And I went right down the street to JFK. And uh, they had services for children of any age. 
They had services for infants and mothers, families, couples, individuals, all any mental illness, or if you just needed help, if your family needed counseling, grief counseling, you name it, it was available for free. You walked in the door, (laughs) you walked in the door, you know, you probably gave your address, phone number, your name, and you got set up. And there were students training and, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists. And it was beautiful. And it was working, like I said, extremely well. They were even doing research at JFK. Um, They had data programs. They were collecting data on the best ways to treat these mental illnesses and what worked and what didn't work. So when I arrived, like I said, JFK was still operating and I had a very good experience there. But uh, as time went on, 1986, 1987, things started to change. They started letting people go. They weren't rehiring psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, They were closing down floors. This was like eight floors of services, okay? They were closing down this floor and that floor. So the other thing that was going on that I was being taught in my training was that a group of, I'm going to say it, rich white men were meeting in uh, uh, what's a, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for some crazy reason. That was the place to go. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. And um, these were high-powered business people and government people and corporate interests um, gathering there. And after meeting there, and this all came out much later, um, but after meeting there, they they devised this new set of policies and a new plan that that turned out to be the um, HMOs, uh, the health maintenance organizations. Um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the other term. But anyway, so mental health and medical health health, the system was totally revised. And what was happening was it was becoming increasingly privatized, okay? So they were figuring out how to shift funding from public funding, which comes from everybody's taxes, including rich people's taxes, okay, to private funding, which if you if you're reading between the lines, means profit driven, okay? That's an enormous change. I mean, the same thing happened in education, not quite as thoroughly. It's harder to make that happen in education. It's happening in medical health, in physical health now. I mean, it's a profit oriented industry now, um, mostly driven by the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, so what happens is the localities, the cities, the counties, the states, they have less and less input as federal funding disappears. And that's what happened beginning in 1980, in the early 80s, when Ronald Reagan was president. And he made this very well known. This is why he was popular. Okay, he was going to defund, basically, public social services. That's why he got elected. I mean, we have to remember that. We have to remember that. Um, So through the 60s and 70s, mental health started to struggle, continue to struggle. Then by 1985, 86, 87, you know, we saw what was happening. Us in the field really saw what was happening. And even our training experiences, we were very well aware. Oh, my goodness. Like everybody's leaving. All the psychiatrists are leaving. All the the top psychologists are leaving. So the students were left kind of running the show. 
And then the waiting lists began to happen. And you'd have these long waiting lists. We all know about those now. I mean, if you're suicidal or homicidal or having a psychotic break or highly anxious, you can't wait six months for an appointment. You just can't. And this system is simply un, 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 unable to care. You know, it's just it's unable to accommodate what what is truly needed by people. And that's what we're seeing now. And every time I hear about um, a shooting, every single time, I know it's at least partially, if not totally, because of mental health issues, because of mental illness. People aren't getting help. Even the 12, 13, 14 year olds who are out there, you know, just running amok out of control. Maybe their parents have extreme problems and are not able really to to keep these children under control. Um, So we all hear about trauma and mm -hmm. trauma is just another word for severe mental illness. Um, You know, so it just spirals and spirals and spirals and I've watched it get increasingly worse, like falling apart in slow motion. And it's, it's devastating. It is. Now tell me something. So you just touched on something. So when you said trauma and being tied into mental illness, now, what about that, that mother who yes. has lost her, her child or father yes. who has lost her child to gun violence? They are now traumatized. Yes. So there's a difference between being traumatized and mental illness, correct? There is. There is. That's a good question. Um, Let me do my best to answer that because it's kind of complicated. But this also goes way back. So unfortunately, um, mental health and psychological health, there are all kinds of terms you can use. And I'm, I don't like the term mental illness, mental health, um, because they're misleading. What they end up doing is making us believe that the mental, let's stick with mental illness for a minute, and then we'll get to trauma and how they're related and how they differ. But when you hear mental illness, you kind of think this person has an illness that's inside themselves. It's inside their brain, let's say. They have a chemical imbalance, let's say. All those terms are inaccurate, if not totally wrong. (laughs) And, And we use these terms as a result of, here's a term for you, as a result of the over medicalization of the human being. People are in distress. Okay. Okay. Let's say they've been traumatized. Okay. Now let me try to bring these together. So let, let's take that mother who lost a son who's now traumatized. She's, she's going through so much. She's going through so much distress And depending on her own childhood and background and experiences, maybe she already had some vulnerabilities, I'd rather say. Uh Maybe she already was diagnosed with a mental illness, to use that term again. But so it's going to be even more difficult for her to handle this incredibly unbearable loss. Okay. So the, the definition of trauma that I like is it's, it's an experience um, or set of experiences that are so overwhelmingly horrible that the brain, the mind can't make sense of it. 
That's a great definition of trauma. So if a child is sexually abused, that's trauma. A child cannot make sense of being raped, okay? Um, a mother who lost a son, she kind of can. <laughs> she can make sense of it. It's so hard. It's so hard. But once she goes through the, the grief processing and the healing, which can take forever, I'm not saying she ever gets over it because she can't, but she can make sense of it. I've seen these women do it. They're amazing. So that's not to say they're not traumatized, but so, so that's a distinction that's hard to make. But again, you see how confusing it gets because they're not mentally ill. Right. Even though they might be traumatized, they're not mentally ill. Any of us would maybe lose our minds for a while mm -hmm. if, you, if you lose a son, you know, to gun violence or a child who sees, or a child who loses his father, how about that, to a shooting and maybe sees it happen. I mean, we don't even know yet very much about how the mind, how a child's mind is processing all this. We're really just learning this, okay? But these are not mental illnesses. Right, right. Now, and, and I want to go back to what you touched on when you can have a traumatic incident, yep. but you've been dealing with so much for so yes. long yes. that an incident can actually fester yes. into mental illness. Yes. yes, yes, it can, it can. So, um, So, uh, you know, I have clients who, let's say they were abused as children, okay? They grew up in a chaotic, impossible home life. Uh, maybe there was substance abuse and, you know, it, it was, it was, it's almost impossible for a child to, you know, get through that unscathed. So let's say as an adult that that person now suffers from uh, depression, um, anxiety attacks. These are all in the, in the book, in the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual, mental illnesses that any of us would, you know, have if we went through that, right? Um, but so now that adult now, let's say, loses a son to gun violence. That current event can trigger, and it does, oh. it can re-trigger all the experiences that that person had, whether or not they've dealt with it in any way, whether or not they've been in therapy. But here's the thing. Most of them have not gotten oh. any therapy because so there's none that, available. That major issue of untreated trauma, and you're there still you living your life. There you go. There you go. So, yeah. and, and I've met the most resilient, amazing, brilliant people struggling, 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 holding on, holding on, doing an amazing job raising their children, an amazing job. They themselves suffer from depression after depressive episode, anxiety attacks, they still keep going. They still keep raising these children. And then a child gets shot. A son gets shot. Ah. And yeah. they still hold on, you know, and so they might have three mental illnesses, according to the book, you know, right. that stupid right. book that I don't have any use for. Okay. Because they're not getting any help. They're not right. getting any help. You can't tell that person, we'll put you on the waiting list. You can't. Exactly. exactly. We do. We do. Now, Dr. Etsy, there are times where I've spoken to people and their family may have a mental illness and they are saying it is so hard to get service for, services for them now. And they could be roaming the streets. They could be wreaking havoc yes. on people. And if they're 302 would uh. So they're only 302 for a little while. What is it, 72 hours? Correct. 
72 hours. And if they ask who did it by law, they have to be told. I, I didn't know that. I think that might be different. Is that, is I, that well, right? Okay. Well, we have our, our mental uh, awareness episode two, but I do know that I, I did make a call because I had to make a call. And when no, I you're right. Germantown Crisis Center, they did say if the person asks, we have to, by law, tell them who it. Right. That puts right. so many people at risk. Yes. So here, here's a question. Go ahead. If someone has a mental illness, we're using this because I'm sure that term has come up over the years. Yes. If has a mental illness and they need help, but yes. they can sign themselves out. Yes. What do, what do we do? How do we help them? This is the, the, this is the insanity. If I could use that old fashioned word, you know, instead of mental illness, this is the insanity that we're living with. I mean, these people aren't insane. This system is insane. The system is sick. It's sick. I don't know what to tell people. I don't know what to tell people where to get help because it's not to be had. I can't even believe I'm saying that to you, but it's true. It's not to be had. There's no help out there. That's sad. And 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 I'm the one. The one thing I also need to point out is, I mean, this is all documented, and it's we've known this for decades and decades. As mental health services, as the money for mental health services decreases, what do you think increases? Violence uh, uh, and trauma. Uh -huh. It's it, it's just glaringly obvious as the money for mental health services decreases, what increases? Violence and trauma. And guess what else increases? The prison population. How about that? I have to say one more thing. The largest provider of mental health services in definitely in Pennsylvania, I think in at least 20 some other states, it's probably more by now, is prisons. The largest provider of mental health services is the prison system. That's all you have to know. That's all we need to know. There's no help out there. You want mental health services? Go to prison. <laughs> That's horrible. It's, that it's, horrible. it's immoral. It's immoral. It's totally immoral. It should be illegal, but I don't know what I don't know enough about the law to say that. It seems like it should be unconstitutional, but it's certainly it's immoral. Uh, uh, That's where well, we are. Thank you so much for being real. And <laughs> you were this was that real conversation because I know there are people who have mental illness in your family and my family. In yes. your neighborhood, people that we have grown up with yes. are suffering and that need help. And we need to do something about it. We need to be contacting the people we put in office to make a change. Dr. Etsy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for everything you do, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for joining me today. You heard that hard conversation. You may have seen Dr. Etsy and I smile every now and then, but it's not a smile of laughter. It's not a smile that we're discounting anything. It's just in disbelief. We need to fight for those who have a mental illness because they need services. So we need to contact those who we put in office to make a change. The power of one starts with you. Peace and love.